Good morning and welcome to the Robinson Avenue Worship Service for July 25th, 2021. I'm Gary Turner, one of the elders, and I'm happy you're here with us today and hope you're spiritually blessed by being here. We do have one rather long announcement uh, that we'd like to make before we begin, and it's regarding our seniors ministry at Robinson Avenue. Uh, we've been blessed this year with 42 new members and kids in 2021, so many of you out there might not have known Harry Fitzgerald, who left after 18 years as our seniors minister. He had an opportunity to return on a part-time basis to the church in Muskogee, Oklahoma, Westside Church of Christ, where he and Joyce were kids and then married. So they wanted to go, and it was very hard for us to let them go. Uh, our seniors ministry is important because we have 252 members over 60 years old. And with Harry's leaving and the COVID restrictions we've had in the past year, we had a gap in our seniors ministry. But the elders have made certain changes knowing our seniors ministry is very important. Uh, first, we appointed two elders to oversee our seniors ministry. Marlon Schaefer and I will be overseeing it and reviewing how we're doing with our seniors. And if you have any questions, we want you to get in touch with either Marlon or me. Secondly, we asked Joe Mohorn to be our visitation minister. As part of this role, Joe will be visiting our members before surgeries or while in the hospital or in rehab and available to pray with them. I remember before my pacemaker surgery, how reassuring it was to have Harry there praying over me. Joe will now be doing that. Thirdly, we asked Marlon Schaefer to lead the Granddad's Devo. Uh, the Devo meets Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock for Bible study, and then they do visitations with our seniors. We want our senior men to be involved with this because it's a very beneficial ministry. Fourthly, we asked Shannon Bowman to be our seniors ministry leader. She will work on consulting on life transition issues like assisted living or health issues or Medicare or other things. And she's also going to recruit leaders for our senior activities and day trips for Friday night game nights and other activities. So Shannon's going to get feedback from our seniors regarding their needs. And in addition to this role, she will still be doing some office administration. So what we want you to do is all of our seniors to get to know Shannon if you have not already. We ask you to volunteer with her, uh, to help where you can, because we have so many talented seniors. And we ask you then to actively participate in activities that are planned for the seniors. Finally, some men would like to talk to a man regarding some of their medical issues. So we ask Nick Poulos to to work consulting on medical issues with our senior men. Nick was a certified pharmacist and store executive with Walgreens for many, many years. So he has a lot of helpful experience here that our men need to take advantage of. So in summary, Marlon and I will oversee as elders. Joe Mohorn will be visitation minister. Marlon Schaefer will be granddad's Devo leader. Shannon Bowman will be Seniors Ministry Leader, and Nick Poulos will be Consultant with Senior Men. Uh, the elders want to thank all these people for stepping up, and we feel with these changes and with everyone's participation, we can continue to have a strong Seniors Ministry. So now let's join in and worship. And before we start, let's pray to our Heavenly Father. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We thank you so much for blessings you've given us. And we ask now a special blessing on our seniors. For what troubles their soul, we ask for peace and contentment. For uh, whatever decisions they have, we ask for wisdom. Uh, for their body, we ask for health. And for their spirit, we ask for a caring church family who, who prays for them. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to supply 
what they need this day. And now we ask for all of us, Heavenly Father, as we worship you, that you supply our spiritual need. Fill us, Heavenly Father, today with your spirit. Help us to be attentive to our worship. Help us to sing with the spirit in us. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be enriched and fulfilled by what we do this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God.
study of 1 Corinthians 13, but, but we're not finished with this love first emphasis. We, we've moved in now to, to speaking about Jesus' teaching of, on love and Jesus' love for us. And, and our theme verse that we introduced at the beginning of the year was, we love because he first loved us. The love that, that we demonstrate, the, the love that we show flows out of the, the love that, that God has for us. And, and, and today's message has one very simple purpose, and that is to, to convince you that, that God really, truly loves you. I'm not a very good golfer, but I, I try and, and I really haven't played as much over the past three years since uh, Dad passed away. Most of the time I played was when I, I got with him and, and we played together, but, but Dad had all these pointers that, that he would give me. Uh, the easier you hit the ball, the farther it will go. That's one of the things that he said to me. That, now, that isn't good advice for everyone, but for me it was because he knew that I tended to overswing and, and the, the club head speed was too much. And if I would just slow down and be a little bit more deliberate, I would get better results. And that was actually pretty good advice. And another one I heard very frequently was keep your head down. Uh, I tended to top the ball, and the reason for that was I wanted to watch and admire my shot rather than, than see it uh, through all the way. And so he would remind me, keep your head down. But, but my favorite was, if you hit the ball straight, you'll have better scores. And that was one of those that I probably said something smart, like, well, thanks, Captain Obvious. Uh, I, I could have figured that one out on my own. But, it, but again, he was right. I, I needed to, to keep the ball in the fairway. Well, my problem was, and I, I've never become a good golfer, and my problem has been not that I didn't accept that advice but that I was unable to absorb that advice that he was giving me. And I think that is the problem that we have with this foundational truth that, that God loves us. We accept that. We, intellectually, we know that's true. It's in the Bible. Uh, the verse that we just saw, we love because he first loved us. We understand that. We accept that, but ha we don't always absorb this truth. And the reason I say that is so many of us are overburdened by guilt and regret. And if we really absorb this truth that, that God really, truly loves us, we would see some of that start to go away and start to disappear and dissipate. 
We don't always love others as we should, especially those who, let's face it, are, are hard to love. And if we really ab absorb this truth that God loves us with all of our flaws and with all of our shortcomings, then we would be more reticent to, to love other people with that same love that, that God has demonstrated towards us. And so what would it mean and what difference would it make if we not only accepted and affirmed this truth, but if we really absorbed this truth? That God really, truly loves me. That he really loves you. And so the last two Sundays, we've spoken about the greatest commands and we've spoken about the Lord's Prayer. And here's what we said in last Sunday's lesson. The Lord's Prayer is what happens when the greatest commands are turned into a prayer. And we're going to return to the first couple of words of that prayer this morning. And the first two words of that, that prayer are our Father. And, and Father is the, the term Abba, which was Jesus' signature term for God. Abba is an Aramaic word. The Jews of, of Jesus' day spoke Aramaic. There were some uh, religious clerics and religious scholars who, who spoke Hebrew, but, but mostly they spoke Aramaic. And, and there's some debate among scholars about how familiar of a term this was. Uh, you've probably heard that this is uh, something akin to a child referring to their father as daddy or as, as papa. And, and that might be the case, but there are other scholars who say, no, this was a term that even adult children would use to, to refer to their, to their father with this term. But in either case, it, this is still a very intimate term. The only person that you would call Abba would be your father. You wouldn't call someone else's father your Abba. You wouldn't even call a, an authority figure in your life your Abba. And prior to Jesus, no one used this term to refer in the first person to God. In the entire history of Judaism, all through the Old Testament and all the rabbinical writings, no one referenced God in the first person as Father. And so this is something new. But Jesus did this all the time. And so look with me at the Gospel of John and just uh, let's go through some of these references and some of these recorded prayers that we have from Jesus. Look with me first at, at John uh, chapter 11, verses 41 and 42. And this is just before Jesus calls Lazarus from the grave. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank, the, thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. Look at chapter 12, verses 27 and, and 28. And this is after Jesus has predicted his death. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, Abba, save me from this hour. No, it was for this reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Look at John chapter 17, verse 1. This is the high priestly uh, prayer of, of Jesus. In verse 1, it says that after this, Jesus looked towards heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your name so that your son may glorify you. And in fact, the term Abba, Father, is throughout this high priestly prayer. It's not just here in verse 1, but it's in verse 5, it's in verse 11, it's in verse 21, it's in verse 24, it's in verse 25. Abba, Father. And it's not just in the, in the Gospel of John. Jesus prayed this on the cross as recorded by Luke. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. In every single recorded prayer that Jesus prayed and addressed God, he addressed him as Father. And the only possible exception to that was one other statement from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was Jesus there was quoting in fulfillment an Old Testament scripture. That's the only time, though, that he didn't address God as Father, as Abba in prayer. Jesus' contemporaries had, had lots of, of names for God. Of course, Yahweh, the, the official name for God, wouldn't even be spoken or pronounced by the Jews. But Lord and God, God Almighty. But, but when Jesus, when he prays, he, he zeroes in on this term, Abba. And not only does he use it, but he wants us to use it. Now, remember, he, he gave the, the Lord's Prayer in response to the disciples' request. Lord, teach us to pray. And, and Jesus says, when you pray, say this. It can be translated, repeat this. Our Father in heaven. And he doesn't say to his disciples at this point, okay, well, now that's the way 
that's the way I, you, this part's not for you. That's the way I address God because he is my father. I, I'm Jesus, but you address him this other way. He says, when you pray, you say this, our father in heaven. He's saying you address God in the same way that I address God because he is your father. And, and this term Abba, again, an intimate term from, from home, from family life. I know this is a delicate subject to talk about simply because not all of us have the same experience in the, in the homes that, that we grew up in or in the homes that we are growing up in. Many of us did learn God's love from home. It, it was taught to us. It was demonstrated for us. It was shown to us. And perhaps when we think of, of God as, as Father, we think of our own fathers. And in Listen, every one of, even the best fathers were not perfect reflections of of God's love. I think you know how much I esteemed my dad. But dad wasn't perfect. I I saw dad lose his temper from time to time. Uh, He had a very loving relationship with my mother, but I witnessed a few arguments that they had, sometimes acting selfishly in those. Dad could be impatient at times. Uh, I hope I'm a good dad to to my kids, but I'm not perfect either. And, And they see my flaws. They see the times that I worry. They see the times that I'm preoccupied with something that I I tend to tune things out and not be as attentive as as what I should be. And and they know the other flaws that I have in my life too. So whenever I demonstrate God's love, I I do it imperfectly. But I hope that I, I do it at least enough for them to get a glimpse of the perfect, steadfast love of God, our Father, our Abba. Others of you, let's face it, you didn't get any of this at home. Home was not a happy place. Maybe home was not a loving place for you. And it may be that that the openings of your heart are are somewhat rusted shut because of that, uh, because of the way your parents loved you or or didn't love you. And if this is your story, you need a a re-education of of the heart and, and a new vision of the beauty of God's love as taught by Jesus and to know that this is something attainable, that, that you can get to the point where you can understand and, and not only accept but absorb the, the truth that, that God loves you and that he is a, a loving father, a perfect father. We're singing a song in our in-person assembly this morning, Good, Good Father. It's, it's one of those that they, they play many times on, on Christian radio. Uh, Chris Tomlin sings it, but he's not the, the he's the artist, but he's not the one who, who wrote the song. There are two uh, gentlemen named Pat and Tony, that's their first names, who, who wrote the song. And I'll be honest, it's, it's not one of my favorite contemporary Christian songs. It, it doesn't connect with me the way that it apparently connects with, with many, many people. And, and I used to wonder, why did they play this so much on, on Christian radio? Why are, why are people requesting this song? Why do people connect with this song like, like they do? What I, what I learned, though, was that the writer, one of those two writers who came up with the, the, the hook, the, the chorus of the song, didn't even know his dad growing up. Didn't know a father's love. And, and so learning about a, a God, a father, an Abba, who loved him perfectly was a huge revelation to him and was intensely personal. And so when he wrote, you're a good, good father, it's, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. And I'm loved by you, That it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. The repetition in those words, and I, I tend to sometimes mock or make fun of songs that are two repetitions, maybe that's the reason I didn't connect with this song initially. But when you think about the the man who who wrote those words, you begin to understand that that he's speaking to himself in an an effort to to convince himself and to not just accept this truth, but to absorb it. You're a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. That's who you are. I'm I'm loved by you. That's who I am. That's who I am. That's who I am. And I wonder if that isn't what it takes for those of us who have accepted this truth, but we haven't absorbed it into our hearts to continually tell ourselves and repeat to ourselves, God loves me, God loves me, God really, truly, deeply, intimately, unconditionally loves me. 
Let's return to the parable of, of the lost son or the lost sons. And remember, we said in an earlier lesson that it could just as easily be called the, the parable of the lost sons because there are actually two sons that are lost. There was the, the prodigal that ran away, but also the elder brother who was at home the whole time, but he didn't realize that he was lost because he didn't appreciate his relationship with his father, a good who was truly a good father. So turn over to Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And again, we've studied this earlier this year, but, but just like the repetition of those song lyrics, this is one of those stories that we need to continue to hear until we absorb its truth. Chapter 15, verses 11 through 20. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out. I'll go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The greatest commands are, are Jesus' creed. It's his core doctrine. The Lord's Prayer is the greatest commands turned into a prayer. The, the prodigal son, the parable that we just read, is the greatest commands turned into a story. And remember the context for this story. It's, it's back in chapter 15, verse 1, where it says the tax collectors and sinners had all gathered around it to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus is telling the story to, to justify his behavior, to justify his actions. And he, he justifies his love for others by appealing to an Abba, to a father who is the focus of this parable. And also telling his audience what it is that God is up to in the world. And it's something surprising. We know what the prodigal did. He takes his share of the estate goes out, squanders that, and, and while living, ends up working for a Gentile pig farmer, not your typical Jewish vocation. And in the process, disgraces his father's good name. And, and this law honoring, this Torah-loving father, when he sees his son coming back, he throws every expectation, he throws every societal pressure out the window. You see, the Jewish custom at the time was that if a son disgraced his father and that son were to return, the elders of the community would take that son to the city square and they would break a pot in front of him. And that was symbolic of the fact of his banishment from the community. That was it for him. And some suggest that perhaps the reason the father runs to the son is so that he could get to him before anyone else does. He's running interference. He's creating static. He's, he's accepting and embracing his son, protecting his wayward son. And we see in verse 21 that the son is expecting what is the norm or would have been the norm at the time. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Look at verses 22 and 23. But the father said to his servants, he didn't even address what the son has just said. Father says to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring, uh, bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of man, mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And so they began to celebrate. No public rebuke, no dragging his son through the, the mud. He throws a party. You see, the son's return was, was proof enough of his softened heart. And so the father gives him clothing that, that represent his elevated status, his robe and his ring and his sandals. And, and they kill the fattened calf. Someone said that the only people not happy that, about the prodigal's return were the elder brother and the fattened calf. And this is what we're supposed to see when, when we really doubt 
that God could love us. After all that we've done, after how far that we've strayed, after all the times that we've messed up in our lives, I'm just not worthy. But this is what we've got to open our hearts to, even when the openings of our hearts have have rusted shut. This is us responding to to God's love. Remember, we we love because he first loved us. He ran out to us to meet us. I want to tell you about someone else who who had to learn the depths of God's love for him. And it was difficult because the the openings of his heart had had rusted shut. Wesley Nelson was a a really sensitive, by his own admission, was a sensitive child. He he called himself a a crybaby and and Friends and family members would, would tease him about it. Some of that teasing wounded him. But he, he tells this story in an autobiographical portion of, of a book. One childhood memory, he says, one day we were out in front of the farmhouse when suddenly I, I realized that my mother had left. She probably just went into the house, but as soon as I missed her, I began, as usual, to scream for her. My father had grown weary of the endless crying and began to chide me for it. This time he said, mother is gone. She's tired of your yelling. She's left for good. She'll never be back. With that, of course, I only screamed louder. I'm sure that my mind would have told me that it was not true, but all I could do was feel the weight of his words and yearning for my mother. The fact is that my mother did come back to me. I'm sure that she must have come back and taken me in her arms and comforted me as she had done before, but that act was blotted from my memory. When my father had, what my father had said made such an impression on me that I had to make it come true. I know, of course, that she continued to care for me, but for me, the emotional ties were broken and her love and care were no longer even a memory for me. For 50 years, I cried for her. Well, this story almost takes a a psychologist to unravel all of this and everyone has different sensitivities and, and perceptions of reality. And this author admits that he was, he was very sensitive as a child by nature. But this much is clear. Wesley's perception of, of God as a loving Abba was distorted by some cruel words from his father and perhaps some insensitivity from his mother. And it took him 50 years to come to terms with the depths of his Abba's love. But here's what happened after 50 years. One warm afternoon, I drove to the top of the Berkeley Hills. I sat on the ground and read for a while, and then I just sat and meditated. Suddenly, it was as though I heard a voice saying, I love you. What made the moment unique was that it was God, the God of steadfast love himself who was inviting me to absorb the gospel. Notice his wording. Not just accept this truth, not just affirm it, but to really absorb it into his heart. He goes on to say that, that his life was never, never the same, and his, his wife and his children immediately noticed a, a change in him. The solvent of Abba's love had, had dissolved the rust that was clogging his heart. And maybe the openings of, of your heart have, have rusted shut to the point that you have trouble believing and absorbing the truth, that you have a father who loves you, one who who waits and watches for you, one who who would run out to greet you. No matter what you've done, his his desire is is to throw a party and to give you the best of everything, not because you're so worthy, but because he's so loving. And in fact, your worth is in the fact that you are created in his image, that that you were made to, to love God and to be loved by God. Maybe you've accepted that intellectually, but you haven't absorbed it into your heart. I encourage you to continue to to dwell in this story of the prodigal, in the affirmations of of Scripture that that God, in in fact, loves us. Repeat those to yourself as often as it takes for those to to sink in, to truly understand the the depths of God's love for us. We, We love because he first loved. I heard an old, old story, how the Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Sought me and bought me.
Charlotte and I lived out in South Carolina. I was experiencing a pretty rough day at work. One of those days where despite 
everything I did, I just couldn't seem to get anything checked off my to-do list. All the while, I kept getting more and more and more put on me. If my day had been officiated, I'm pretty sure a flag would have been thrown for piling on. <laughs> It got to the point where I felt like just raising a big white flag in surrender and throwing up my hands and saying, no moss, no moss, I give, I give. But instead, I decided to take a late lunch and go out in my car and just drive around and try to regroup. And while I was out driving around, I had the radio on. Now, I admit a lot of times when I had the radio on, I don't focus on the words of the song, but this day I did. And on the radio came a song that most of us are familiar with. It was a song by Simon and Garfunkel, Bridge Over Troubled Water. If you know the song, you know it's a very touching, heartfelt song from one friend to another, where one friend tells the other, look, when you're weary, when you're down, when you're struggling, when you have no one else to turn to, just know that I'm by your side. I'm here for you. In fact, I'm willing to lay down my life for you like a bridge over troubled water. And when I heard the words of that song, given the rough day I'd been having, I just blurted out, boy, sure would be nice to have a friend like that. No sooner did I get those words out of my mouth that, that the thought hit me. Scott, you do have such a friend. His name is Jesus. And then the words from a, a song that I've been singing since childhood came to mind. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. This morning, as we partake of the Lord's Supper together, I invite you to join me in reflecting on the friend we have in Jesus a friend who loves us more than we'll ever know or be able to comprehend. A friend who's willing to be by our side through thick and thin. A friend who is willing to die on the cross for you and me, laying down his life like a bridge over that large gulf of sin that separated us from God, allowing us cross over and be reconciled and reunited with our Father and our God to enjoy a very intimate Abba Father relationship for this current life and for the life to come. Oh, what a gift. Oh, what a God. Oh, what a Savior. Let's pray together. Father, as we think about the fact that the creator of the universe was willing to give up his life through his son for us, we're so humbled. And Lord, we just thank you so much for that gift. And thank you so much for your love for us and for the fact that your son died for us so that we can have our sins forgiven and be reunited with you to enjoy a very intimate Abba Father relationship. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your Son. Father, as we partake of this loaf, which represents Christ's body, crucified on the cross for us, may we do so in a manner that pleases you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's again pray together for the cup. Father, as we prepare to partake of this cup, which represents Christ's blood shed for us, we just thank you for the cleansing that takes place through the gift of your Son and the washing of through his blood. And for the righteousness that we're imputed from Christ so that we can again joy an Abba Father intimate relationship with you. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for meeting our need through your Son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh, haste to its free. Tis the fountain of love from the source above, and he bids. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come?
Oh, oh, oh.